Um, I'm back, and I'm happy to be introducing our next keynote speaker, John Haas. John is the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Ava Labs, the team behind the Avalanche blockchain and ecosystem. Ava Labs' top-tier BD team is known for some of the best institutional partnerships in the blockchain industry. John is also a double USC alumnus. His keynote talk will be about the Web3 world according to Avalanche. Please welcome John Nahas. Can you guys hear me? Okay, there we go. Thanks, Gio. Good morning, everyone. Uh, fight on to my fellow Trojans. It's always great to be back here and be back in this great room. Uh, what's going on, guys? Um, so two things that I love, SC and, of course, Avalanche. So I want to talk to you guys today a little bit about the way we see Web3 at Avalanche, right? Everyone talks about Web3. What does it mean? Everybody kind of has their own explanation for it. It's like one of those words that just is thrown at everything that, that, that exists in blockchain and, web, and in you know, crypto, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to give you guys kind of uh, an overview of how we see it, what it means to us, and what we are doing in order to pl proliferate that. So quick uh, show of hands, how many people have heard of Avalanche? OK, good to know. So what you mostly have heard, probably, is if you're very uninitiated, if you're just surface level, is it's another chain that has a, you know, an EVM c compatibility. If you are into the weeds, you know about all the things we're doing. So I hope to go through that a little bit today and kind of give you more of an overview as to what we believe Web3 is and why we believe that we're kind of poised to do that. So let's see. There we go. So what is Web3? To me and to us, the way we look at Web3 is a global decentralized digital economy. It needs to reach all over the world. It needs to be decentralized. And it's a digital economy, right? So just like Web 2 or the internet was the information age, it allowed for the free flow of information. What blockchains and crypto and Web 3 really should be doing, and the goal here, is for the free flow of value between any two points, person to person, business to person, business to business, whatever it may be. And what is value, right? Value traditionally is money. But anything that's digitized in a digital economy can hold value. Your time can hold value. Your personal data can hold value. Uh, something that you own, a real world asset, which is a terrible name for something because that implies that things on chain are not real. Um, but meme coins could be our value. There's value to attention. There's so many things that if you put a wrapper around it, you digitize it, you tokenize it, you can ascribe value to it. And when you have something of value, you can trade it, exchange it, and sell it for something else that has value. So that's the way we kind of look at it. And by connecting all these different things, whether you're an artist, a builder, a developer, a company, you should be able to interact with somebody else without somebody in the middle telling you that you can or can't, or, or, or putting restrictions upon you and, and collecting uh, a fee. But before we kind of fix what's going on or talk about how to get there, we need to talk about the things that are wrong currently with Web3. So first of all, it's a high barrier of entry. For those in this room, you're familiar with crypto. You know the language. You know the lingu lingo. But I would say that we are actually having an elitist problem in Web3. We like our difficult words and our lingo and our jargon and our seed phrases and all these other things so that we can then tell people, oh, you don't know what a seed phrase is? Oh, you don't, you, you, you don't have a non-custodial wallet? Oh, you don't use MetaMask? Like, you're not going to onboard millions, of, or if not tens of millions, if not billions of people unless you make it as easy, if not easier, than what exists today. Right? Like, the, the studies show this. We like to think that crypto is this global thing. Well, crypto is a global thing because the news talks about it, right? And you hear about it on the internet. But in reality, there's only a couple million people on chain and only a couple hundred thousand people actively on chain every day. It's the same people that just go around in circles and you get maxis that fight about where and where to be doing something. And it's really irrelevant. You've got to put that stuff in the background. Second, it's unreliable. This tech is still new, right? People hear about it, but you have chains going down, you have chains reorging, you have bridge issues, you have hacks, you have all these things that to the average person they don't want to hear about. They don't want to deal with. And it's kind of a turnoff to most people. And the final thing is that it's siloed. 
You have some chains that are NFT specific. You have some chains that are institutional. You have some that do enterprise. You have some that do NFTs. No one's going to use 10 different things for 10 different use cases. You need to build something that opens up the transfer of value across the board. What do we need in order to reach this goal of uh, you know, a global decentralized digital economy? Well, the way we look at this is very simple. Three things, wallets. These are users, people. People on chain, people doing transactions, people doing things, right? Those people need assets to interact with. So, okay, we got NFTs, we got meme coins. We are now seeing tokenized real world assets or on chain assets. You're starting to see the institutional guys get into the space and provide things. So you need more assets. Like I said, right, the value, whether it's time or data or privacy or whatever it is that you can digitize and trade in this new economy. And of course, you need the applications for the users to transact these, these assets on. You need new applications, new different things. We've seen the rise of AMMs and all these different borrow lend protocols and everything that started in DeFi, and that's great. We need to expand that. And these are kind of the ways we look at it. If you're familiar with Avalanche, or at least with the Avalabs business development team that I oversee, this is the way we've built the team. And it starts on the very left with the most traditional incumbents. This is institutional and capital markets. Gio mentioned that we've been very strong here recently. That's the recent narrative. But you can't be strong in one thing. You need to be strong in everything, or at least be competitive in everything, in order to allow for that transfer of value. So on the institutional capital market side, we've worked with JP Morgan, with Citi, with Wellington, with Tiro, with top financial players to build use cases on Avalanche and work within the Avalanche ecosystem. On enterprise, same thing. Enterprise, I, I, I define as an existing business or a Fortune 500 getting into Web3. Whether it's Lemonade Insurance, doing parametric insurance on chain, SK Planet in Korea doing loyalty and rewards. This is payments, this is DPIN, this is all the things that could be kind of bringing people on chain. Exchanges and wallets are the entry point for most people into this world, right? This is your Coinbase's, your Binance's, your MetaMask's, your whatever non-custodial wallets that you need, but this is the distribution point. Gaming, something else we're very strong. I was at GDC yesterday up in San Francisco. We're bringing tons of games on chain. Traditionally, gaming, when it first arrived on scene, was a token masquerading as a game with play to earn. It wasn't a game, it was a token called a game. When you played something around with a token, you made some money, you called it a game. This is real gaming, right? This is Nexon and Maple's bringing their Maple Story universe onto Avalanche. This is uh, Godzilla and Shrapnel, triple A shooter games that are doing all of their in game assets in the background. Gamers care about one thing the game. If, it's, if your game is about the blockchain, it's not about the game. The blockchain enables the transfer of value that's previously been stopped or, or restricted behind the scenes. Of course, NFTs, we call this kind of arts and culture, right? This is PFPs, meme coins, but also what NFTs could be. Your college diploma here one day should be an NFT, right? You apply for a job, they want to prove that you've actually graduated from USC or that your grades were good or whatever it may be. You don't have to come here. To, I think the office is actually right outside here and, and get a certified copy in an envelope and you got a FedEx. Like, we're in 1920, right? You should be able to have a NFT or an NTT, a non-transferable token that you own that is tied to your persona that you can share as a credential, right? Whether it's your home deed, whether it's your, your diploma, whether it's your medical records, these things should be tied to you in a digital fashion and be able to be transferred or shown to the parties that are needed. And then of course, finally, DeFi, decentralized finance. This is the innovation hub, right, for crypto natives. Nothing you see today from BlackRock, JP Morgan, Citibank, all these big names getting into crypto would be if it was not for what's going on in DeFi, right? The, the, the people in these organizations do not change their business model unless they need to change it, unless they see innovation or a threat. And that threat or, and innovation comes from what's been done by some really amazing DeFi protocols to date. So we're really proud of the DeFi that we have on Avalanche, of course, and that's just the beginning, right? We still don't have a killer app in crypto that has 5, 10, 50 million users. We haven't proven that out yet. Everything has just been some iteration of something that currently exists. But I'm excited to see where this goes. Maybe it's DPIN, maybe it's something else that pops up. So what the future needs to kind of take things into account, right? And we need to look at the ways in which we're going to create this global digital decentralized economy. 
and it needs to have certain tenets that are foundational to that premise. First, it needs to be faster, right? You, if, if it's gonna take you tens of minutes, or if not hours, to send money, you might as well use ACH, you might as well use your bank, you might as well use Venmo, right? You need a digital economy that is as fast, if not faster than what currently exists. It needs to be inexpensive. And I purposely am not using the word cheap here. People always say fast and cheap chains. Well, things that are cheap have a connotation. They're cheap. When things are cheap, they're not always the best. They break, they have issues, they have downtime. It needs to be as inexpensive, if not more inexpensive than what currently exists, right? Sending somebody 50 bucks of USDC on ETH costing more than a wire, you might as well use a wire. That's not gonna help you. So layer twos need to come in, other chains come in. So we need it to be as inexpensive, if not more inexpensive than what currently exists. And it has to be usable. So I mentioned issues that we're having as an industry trying to figure these things out. Nobody's gonna give up the world that they know and that they're comfortable with. For a world they don't know and, and, and is foreign to them, if it's not as easy if not, to use if not, than what currently exists. And it has to be decentralized. This is something we take for granted. Decentralization is the perfect thing that you take for granted and that you don't need until it's too late and you realize, oh, we wish we had that. The current world is centralized. Your data is centralized. Your assets are centralized. People control your, your value and your time and your data and your privacy. Only with decentralization can you get there. Now, does everything have to be decentralized from day one? No, that's like, this is the ultimate goal, right? But we should always strive to get to decentralization more and more. Very proud that Avalanche always ranks as top three most decentralized chains. And I'm gonna talk about some things that we do that are different, but the core foundation needs to be decentralized. No one can, should be able to shut down Avalanche. No one should be able to shut down Ethereum or Bitcoin, right? You can run private permission things, but you do it on a public chain. You do it on a public infrastructure, just like the roads that we have. There might be uh, diamond lanes or there might be toll roads, but those are all on public infrastructure. So that's a great way to look at it. And it needs to be sustainable, right? Uh, you know, aside from Bitcoin, which has its hash rate and all the great stuff there, like the energy secures Bitcoin, the technology of the future cannot be less sustainable and emit more than the current things that exist, right? When you look at a bank and their brick and mortars and all the stores they have and everything that exists, we should be more green than that, right? And very proud that Avalanche, with its novel consensus, is very lightweight and very green. The entirety of the Avalanche network, 1,600 validators, millions of transactions, billions of dollars transacted and secured, use less than 50 US households worth of energy in an entire year. That's something to be proud of, and we should strive to be more sustainable. So that's kind of where we are, what's been missing, what we need, and the way Avalanche is tackling these things. First and foremost is through subnets. So subnets, first of all, are a terrible term, uh, and I'll be the first to admit that. It is, you know, our founder is a former professor. This is a very technical term. A subnetwork is just a network as part of a larger network. So if you've interacted with Avalanche, primarily the C chain, which is the EVM, public EVM chain, that is actually a subnet but it's a public one. Subnets are application specific or business specific chains, but what they really are is their utilization of existing validators. So with Avalanche, you can launch private permission chains like we did with JP Morgan and Citibank and all these other guys. It's private and it's permissioned. You can't use it, but it exists there. Others have permissioned public chains. A lot of the enterprises want this, and gaming companies want this. They want to control their validators, but it's open for all of you to use. That's what we've had thus far to date, and we've had 50 of these launched with another 50 coming this year. Later in the year, we really unlock, I think, the most exciting part, which is public and permissionless. So you see this happening a lot with the Cosmos ecosystem and a lot of credit to them, right? You see the Say and the Monads and the Injectives and all these public permissionless kind of innovative chains that are crypto native launch. By mid-year this year, you'll be able to do that with Avalanche. So within one ecosystem, you can have a bank, you can have an enterprise in gaming, you can have public permissionless chains. So if you start to think about it, you have all these things working together. The goal for us is many chains acting as one. 
right? So if you think about L2s, L3s, the base layer is here and then you build up from it. So everything sits at a pinnacle on the bottom. It's a lot of pressure to put. Subnets are not a scaling solution that we came up with because we had to figure out how to, to, to add more throughput on the chain. Subnets were foundational to the Avalanche white paper five years ago. So we've been building towards many chains under one umbrella. So if you really think about it, Avalanche is a layer zero where you can launch your own blockchain. And the, the, the crawl moment we had is when we went live with the C chain, the public EVM chain. Our walk moment is when we launched subnets. And now we will when we launch public permissionless subnets. And our run moment is coming now. Oh, there's a, sorry, there's a slide missing. So the run moment is interoperability. Interoperability comes to Avalanche with something we call warp messaging and teleporter. This just started going live on mainnet last week and is going to continually expand. So now you connect all these different chains. You allow for that value to transfer. So if you have a Wells Fargo chain and a JP Morgan chain, they don't have to talk to anybody else or they can just talk to each other. But let's say you have a business and you want to run payments. Well, if, you're enable, if that banking chain enables you to do it, you can do payments through it. Or if there's a USDC chain where there's, only, where there's only stable coins being used, you can tap into that chain to pull liquidity and make payments. So now you start to see your gaming assets on one chain move to another chain that where you can do trading that can go to another chain. And you start to move assets across chains like, like as easy as it is to move a file from a folder on your desktop. That's the goal. That's the vision. That's where we should be, right? It shouldn't take minutes, hours, days to move for value from a bank to a bank, and it sure as hell shouldn't do it in Web3. Ah. So we do this with better products. Um, Ava Labs, as the company supporting the Avalanche ecosystem, does this. We do this with our core wallet, which has its ups and downs, but for the most part is built to take into account this universe of many chains and moving things around. Better bridges to be able to transfer assets um, between these different, these different chains. Our goal is to set the example for what builders should be building and could be building and building on top of it. So this is you know, a cornerstone of where we kind of like to see things go. And products need to be built, right? A lot of times, if you look on crypto Twitter, you see the same people arguing about the same minutia about blockchain details, right? Like something nobody care, really cares about except two founders and it's an ego game, right? But for the most part, blockchains are a base layer infrastructure. The things that matter are the products. The things that matter are the applications, right? The applications and the partners, the developers, the users, the, bu the businesses, the things that will be utilizing this technology to create a global decentralized digital economy are the real stars here, right? Nobody goes on Netflix on their TV. It doesn't say Netflix powered by AWS, right? Nobody cares about AWS. We're still early in this game. So, you know, powered by Avalanche, powered by Solana, powered by base, what a build on base, whatever. We still have to like put our stake in the ground and go there because we're still early. And hopefully in a few years from now, we won't be. And we'll be able to just say this great application. Right? Because as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a killer app yet. There isn't the social media moment that, that was for Web 2, for Web 3. There hasn't been something where people say, I am using this product. Right? It's the, the, the product, the application, is not the star. We're still talking about the chains. Hopefully, that's not going to be the case. And hopefully, with what we're building, by allowing kind of blockchain out of a box for whoever needs it, whether it's a company or builder, a dev, or someone really innovative, that's great. And the way we look at it is we've had, great fa we've had fantastic success with some headline stuff, right? These big names are there to serve one reason, transparently. They're there to show people this is what's possible because this person who is trusted in an authority is doing it. But the real excitement is by the developers and the innovators and the crypto natives who are building things and learning from those that have come before them. That, are, that, are, that, that might see something happen on a payments thing and say, that's interesting, and then something else in a gaming chain say, that's interesting. Well, if I were to maybe build something that would utilize the best aspects of this, I could create that next best thing. That's our job. That's our goal. And that's how we believe we get to uh, where we want to go. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, everybody.
We've got time for questions. We'd love to. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm I'm wondering, do, do you do you guys are you guys launching any use case related to identity and privacy, self-sovereign identity, something something about that? There are some teams that are working on these things specifically right now. Um, we, as Ava Labs, are not uh, specifically in this, but we are very eager to support people who are. So, um, in my capacity, we do two things, right? We invest in teams, we support in teams, we get them the resources they need. So, uh, there are a handful of people doing this. Uh, we're excited. Again, we don't know what, here's the thing, right? We, no one knows what sticks until you, it, it, it actually launches and people want to use it. But yeah, more than, more, we definitely are and are excited to do more. Sure. Thank you for that, uh, that awesome talk, uh, learned a lot. I've seen Ava Labs recently give grants, um, well, maybe not grants, but basically purchasing up uh, uh, meme coins, gr like the, the top five, I think there's a specific thing for it. Do you guys have plans to do similar things either for specific creators or people who are building things for creators on chain, um, like platforms or just infrastructure to be built, not, not necessarily like PFP creators, but people that want to get involved in Web3 but don't really know the entry points yet. Yeah, absolutely. So on the meme coin stuff, you know, we got a lot of grief for this. So the foundation got a lot of grief for doing this. Um, you know, we didn't have a meme coin culture on Avalanche, and then we had one launch that really kind of took things by storm. And now there's 62,000 unique on-chain holders of that meme coin. So the foundation sees it. You have to start thinking of meme coins, and I was a big skeptic personally, and I, I will say I was wrong. You have to look at it as a community. It's another, it's another form of community. But more than anything, when you want to do airdrops, when you want to tag who's the most involved in your community, well, these guys hold it. Here's a nice thing. You can, you can reach out to these people directly. On the arts and culture side and the creator side, which you're talking about, in that vertical that I mentioned on the NFTs, we actually do have a, a specific dedicated program to that, and it's called Avasance. It's like avalanche renaissance, um, where, we do, where we have uh, a mentor program Across, whether it's digital artists, um, photographers, whatever it may be, mentors, and we do these in cohorts. We just finished one with 50 people that had five mentors, so like groups of like eight or 10, whether, you know, teaching artists, up and coming artists, creators, how to monetize, how to use Web3 in the digital ecosystem to benefit them. So one guy was uh, somebody who was, I believe was an animator for one of the top cartoons. I don't want to misspeak. But he, he like had like 2 million followers on Instagram, right? And he would doodle stuff and put it on there and everyone followed him. Well, he was like, now he's selling those things as one of ones on Avalanche. So we, he goes through a course. We teach you how to utilize the technology to benefit yourself. We do give grants um, to help these artists maybe with their kind of like, think of it as a studio model, right? You need help. You need upfront capital. We will help innov uh, that innovation and, and spur that uh, from the beginning. Uh, and we've also done this with, with platforms like um, there's I think Campfire, there's uh, Super Chief has a gallery. So we're working with art galleries, we're working with artists, working with musicians as well, uh, creators across the spectrum to support them in creating things and having them on chain. Hi, thank you so much for speaking today in your presentation. Um, just out of curiosity, what did your company and you know either you specifically learn after the fall of FTX? If it sounds too good to be true, it is, right? Um, I, I personally had met Sam on several occasions, and look, when someone's, it's, it's, you get these. This happens in crypto, and crypto is still very small. But I think it's an anecdote for just the general world. If some, if there's, if there's this whole like shtick going on, right? If there's this whole front, there must be something behind it, right? The whole vegan who wears cargo shorts and t-shirts and doesn't know how to tie his shoelaces. It's so contrived in hindsight, right? Uh, we weren't that close with him, uh, frankly, thankfully. Uh, he had bet on he had bet on another ecosystem, uh, very heavily. So we 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 saw that as kind of being a bias. So we purposely didn't engage too much. But this happens in crypto, and it doesn't just happen with FTX or, or with an Alameda or with an SBF. It happens 
most recently with uh, in the Solana ecosystem, pre-seed, uh, pre-sale, like send me a bunch of your money. You don't know who I am, but send me your money and I promise you'll, I'll make you more. We had someone do it on Avalanche and these kind of grifters throughout history, wherever it is, whether it's you know, in the town square or on the internet or now on Web3, always seek to take advantage of people with the hopes of, of big dreams. Nothing ever happens without putting the time, effort, and work behind it. So if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dash. Thank you for coming out. This is a infor very informative presentation. Uh, you mentioned that Web3 hasn't really had like its aha moment mm -hmm. that brought like an extreme amount of users. Um, what would you say was like Web 2's aha moment or application that kind of where everyone kind of realized like, oh, this is this is the next big thing? I'd say two things for Web 2. The initial days, or maybe even it was Web 1, I don't know. But email. I'm old enough to remember AOL. I had an AOL account because you had email. When I graduated high school, I had like a personal email that I barely used. I didn't really start using email on a day-to-day -day basis until I was a freshman here. And I came here and I was given a USC email. I was like, oh, it's so cool. Like I have my name on this. Before it was like usernames and stuff, right? Uh, email, transfer of communication. And then what put that on its head was social media, right? Social media was really the thing that connected billions of people, right? Whether it's used for good or bad, there's both sides of that. I think that's where we need to be able to send assets in Web3 like you can send and receive emails. And then from that, turn it into something else that is much more interesting and much more unique, right? Um, we have a long way to go. We're not there yet. And I, you know, we, you're kind of, it's a kind of a difficult, difficult situation because if the internet had the internet to promote itself, how quickly would that have happened, right? Crypto has the internet and everything is seen from meme coins to boom and bust to hacks. You hear about everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You always hear about the ugly and the bad, just like with the news, a lot more than you do about the good, right? There are good things being built right now. I think we still have a ways to go. But yeah, so if we're gonna try and, we, if we were to copy, which I don't want us to do, it would be email and social media. What those equivalents are gonna be for us, I don't know yet. Last one, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Sally, I was curious if you could more go more in depth onto like transfer of assets, chain to chain, or just how to make that faster. And mm -hmm. it, I guess it could be technically like a back end question, but. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you how we look at it, right? Currently you have, well, let me, let me take a step back. The way it exists right now, and just perspective. You have Bitcoin, single asset, single chain. You have Ethereum, single asset, uh, single chain multi-asset with its L2s. Solana is in that same world. Avalanche is multi-chain multi-asset. Cosmos is kind of like this too. We're, we're very, like, we, we give them a lot of credit in their wor work. But it, unless you connect all these things, it really doesn't work. So if you think about Avalanche, the C chain is what's pe what people are familiar with, but really the magic is the P chain, which is where validation and delegation occurs. That's like a library of all the validators and delegators. Now, if you're a validator and delegator on Avalanche, you validate and delegate the main chain, right? And if, but you can also do a subnet, okay? So a subnet is just a subnetwork of validators with its own chain. Well, if you have this library of validators across validating the chain and you have multiple subnets, there is a communication layer there. Now we're gonna be in, uh, instilling something new that allows you to validate a subnet without having to validate the main chain. Because if you're a bank, if you're an institution, you do not wanna be validating the main chain where you don't know what's going on in crypto, things are happening in KYC, AML. That's why we saw the rise of enterprise chains a few years ago and they failed to, to get traction because they live in a, in a vacuum. You might as well just use an existing database. You don't need a blockchain if it's not connected to anything. But what we're seeing now, and th so the way we solve for it is every chain has its BLS keys uh, sent to the, to the P chain, and there's a store of all those BLS keys. And then you can start to, s you can send messages and send assets through messaging between, within the ecosystem, right? And the goal here is a lot of people, you know, people are like, oh, these are, you know, for, there was a while where we were called the Fed chain because we were working with all the banks and enterprises. 
but then in the same t token, we're supporting meme coins and people's head explodes because you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. But if you're gonna support all these assets and all these use cases, especially on the institutional enterprise side, they want to start permissioned and work towards permissionless because regulation's not there, we don't know what compliance looks like. So we provide that chance. Similarly, if you're, in, in, if you're if a builder, you can launch your application on the C chain. And if you hit a critical mass and you wanna manage your own gas and your own token and have everything, you launch your own chain. You know, Avalanche is not an EVM chain. It's every subnet can have its own gas token, can run its own virtual machine, can do whatever it wants. So we can progress and grow and the network will as well. So it's kind of the way we look at it. All right, good. Thanks everyone.